Hey all, Ron here from Military Images Magazine with a new episode of Life on the Civil War Research Trail. In his 1875 memoirs, General William Tecumseh Sherman shared his thoughts about the organization and the composition of the wartime U.S. Army and why it was so successful and also why there were some challenges. As I was reading it, I imagine his words would be appropriate today for a keynote speech to a graduating class of West Point cadets or a gathering of veterans or an assembly of everyday Americans seeking to better understand just how the army works, at least in the 19th century. Though Sherman's words are suited for the military of a different time, his underlying emphasis on the quality of America's human resources and how we develop and make use of them resonate today. At least they resonated with me. One of the lines that stuck with me is this one, quote, some of our best corps and division generals, as well as staff officers, were from civil life, end quote. It makes more sense when you hear the full passage. So let me read this to you from Sherman's 1875 memoir, where he gives us his thoughts about the army. So it starts out almost like a lecture. Here we go. Three such regiments compose a brigade, three brigades a division, and three divisions a corps. Then by allowing to an infantry corps, a brigade of cavalry, and six batteries of field artillery, we would have an efficient corps d'armée of 30,000 men whose organization would be simple and most efficient and whose strength should never be allowed to fall below 25,000 men. The corps is the true unit for grand campaigns in battle, should have a full and perfect staff and everything requisite for separate action, ready at all times to be detached and sent off for any nature of service. The general in command should have the rank of lieutenant general and should be, by experience and education, equal to anything in the war. Habitually with us, he was a major general, specially selected and assigned to the command by an order of the president, constituting, in fact, a separate grade. The division is the unit of administration and is the legitimate command of a major general. The brigade is the next subdivision and is commanded by a brigadier general. The regiment is the family. The colonel, as the father, should have a personal acquaintance with every officer and man and should instill a feeling of pride and affection for himself or nowadays herself so that his officers and men would naturally look to him for personal advice and instruction. In war, the regiment should never be subdivided, but should always be maintained entire. In peace, this is impossible. The company is the true unit of discipline, and the captain is the company. A good captain makes a good company, and he should have the power to reward as well as punish. The fact that soldiers would naturally like to have a good fellow for their captain is the best reason why he should be appointed by the colonel or by some superior authority instead of being elected by the men. In the United States, the people are the sovereign. All power originally proceeds from them, and therefore the election of officers by the men is the common rule. Now, this is wrong because an army is not a popular organization, but an animated machine, an instrument in the hands of the executive for enforcing the law and maintaining the honor and dignity of the nation. And the president, as the constitutional commander in chief of the army and navy, should exercise the power of appointment subject to confirmation of the Senate of the officers of volunteers as well as regulars. No army can be efficient unless it be a unit for action and the power must come from above, not from below. 
the president usually delegates his power to the commander in chief and he to the next, and so on down to the lowest actual commander of troops, however small the detachments. No matter how troops come together, when once united, the highest officer in rank is held responsible and should be consequently armed with the fullest power of the executive, subject only to law and existing orders. The more simple the principle, the greater the likelihood of determined action, and the less a commanding officer is circumscribed by bounds or by precedent, the greater is the probability that he or she will make the best use of his command and achieve the best results. The regular army and the military academy at West Point have in the past provided, and doubtless will in the future, provided the ample supply of good officers for future wars, but should their numbers be insufficient, we can always safely rely on the great number of young men of education and force of character throughout the country to supplement them. At the close of our Civil War, lasting four years, some of our best corps and division generals, as well as staff officers, were from civil life but I cannot recall any of the most successful who did not express a regret that he had not received an early life instruction in the elementary principles of the art of war instead of being forced to acquire this knowledge in the dangerous and expensive school of actual war. But the real difficulty was, and will again to be obtained, an adequate number of good soldiers we tried almost every system known to modern nations, all with more or less success, voluntary enlistments, the draft, and bought substitutes. And I think that all officer of, officers of experience will confirm my assertion that the men who voluntarily enlisted at the outbreak of the war were the best, better than the conscript, and far better than the bought substitute. When a regiment is once organized in a state and mustered into the service of the United States, the officers and men become subject to the same laws of discipline and government as the regular troops. They are, in no sense, militia, but compose a part of the Army of the United States, only retain their state title for convenience and yet, may be principally recruited from the neighborhood of their original organization. So there you have Sherman's thoughts in his reflections in his 1875 memoir about the U.S. Army, the recruits, the officers, the raw human resources that we have in America, and the fact that an army is not necessarily a popular sovereign. It's not a popular democracy. It's not a sovereign uh, controlled by the people. It has to go from the top down, not the top up. So thanks for listening. We'll see you on the next episode of Life on the Civil War Research Trail.